My name is Haley. I am from Pro Writing Aid, and my guest today is AJ Ogilvie. AJ is a professor of business communication at the University of Southern California. He's taught business communication, consulting, and writing courses for over 10 years, um, and he's published research on the theories of teaching, learning, and communication, and we are so thrilled to have him both here and on staff at Pro Writing Aid. So welcome, AJ. Thanks so much, Haley. Let's jump in. So today's uh, topic is um, five principles of clarity and how do we make meaning and create understanding through reader-centric writing. And um, I want to start off by introducing you to what I believe to be one of the most clearest pieces of writing, like a model for how we would think about clear writing. So a few years ago, um, the New York Times received a legal letter from, uh, at the time, uh, Donald Trump was running for president and they asked him uh, that the Donald Trump's lawyer asked the New York Times to remove an article about Donald Trump and the legal counsel, the lawyer for the New York Times wrote a letter to um, back to the uh, Donald Trump's lawyer. And um, uh, what happened was that the New York Times published this letter. And again, the, the legal counsel for the New York Times is not, he's not a, a, a journalist. He's a legal, you know, he's a lawyer. And he, they published the letter that he wrote. And what happened was it, it went completely viral. So it had 1 million readers in 24 hours. It was the most viewed and most emailed article at the New York Times. And um, emails, uh, he, he got emails from T Tanzania, from the Northern Mariana Islands, from England, Sri Lanka, Australia, and all over the US. And he had to actually write, which is, uh, the second, um, the second uh, image right here, he had to write a follow-up article uh, based on, because it was so popular. So I want to use this. Uh, one of the things that whenever we're talking about clarity or when we're trying to, whenever, whenever we're talking about good writing, it's really important to have really good examples. So I'm using this uh, as a really good example of what I believe to be um, very clear writing. So I'm going to give everybody about 30 seconds and um, 30 to 45 seconds just to read this and just to maybe ask yourself at the end, you know, what do you think of the clarity of this writing? Okay, cool. So I'm going to move on. But again, when I'm referring to really clear writing and the five principles, I'm going to come back to this paragraph so that um, we can see how the five principles are illustrated in an actual piece of writing. So, but, but first I want to talk a little bit about what do I mean by clarity? And what I love is when you look at the, the origins of the term clarity, it actually comes from old French. And it started with this idea of clarity as a brightness, as a radiance, as a splendor. And I think sometimes we think of clarity as um, something difficult. It's something, uh, you know, that we, we, it's hard to create. And I want us to think about how might we think of clarity in our writing as creating a sense of brightness or radiance for our reader. And my own, my own definition um, of clarity is it's the nature and depth of understanding the nature, the kind of understanding and the deepness, the depth of that understanding a reader has of a text meaning. Um, okay, I also love metaphors. So I'm a sucker for good metaphor. So I wanna give you three metaphors. And I think these metaphors kind of organize our thinking um, about clarity. So there are three metaphors that I've kind of come up with to think about when we write, how should we think about what we're trying to do when we write? So the first one is I had a, this basketball image, these two um, young women playing basketball. The first one is I had a basketball coach in uh, high school named Mr. Hamilton. And Mr. Hamilton told us that um, if you make a pass and your teammate doesn't catch it, it's your fault. And I really love this metaphor because I think it uh, applies so well to writing, which is we often write something and we're, when someone doesn't understand it, we kind of assume that it's on them, right? But as Mr. Hamilton says, like, when you make a pass, you need to figure out exactly how that person needs to receive that pass. And we would say to, we would say to Coach Hamilton, well, what if you walk up to the person and, you know, you give them the most gentle pass and they still don't catch it? He'd say, that's still your fault. Like, you, if you have to walk up to them, you know, put the ball in their stomach and wrap it around their uh, wrap, wrap their arms around it. That's what you have to do. And uh, I really love that metaphor. So that's how should, we should think about it. When someone doesn't understand something that we've written, 
the burden is on us to, to make it clear, to make it right. The next thing, this is in the pink, uh, the, the, the group of guys in the middle, this is the 2016 Japanese relay team in the Olympics. The, this team was not fast. They were one of the slower teams, but they still won bronze because of their emphasis on the, pat, the baton passing. And so in a way, what I love about this is that I want us to think about when we are, when we are writing, how are we trying to hand over meaning to our reader that, that, that meets them in their stride, right? That meets them where they are and where they want to go. Um, and so the, the, this Japanese team focused so specifically on the baton pass that they end up winning bronze and nobody thought that. But I, I love this idea of like, how are we handing over ideas or information to our reader? Next, um, and this is a nod uh, perhaps to the, U, the UK, people coming from the UK. Um, I believe that's George, the um, prince uh, or uh, the uh, princess Kate's son. Um, and so, uh, and I have, I have young children and what, um, parenting experts say is that when you're trying to communicate to your child, you really need to get at eye level, right? You need to get down and see the world from their perspective. And that changes how that child will interact with you. And I love this metaphor for, for being, for writing. So how can you get at your reader's eye level and start, start communicating with them from their vantage point, from their perspective? Um, okay. And often, we often think about writing, we, when we're starting to write, we go, what do I want to say? And I want us to maybe reconsider that question as a place to begin. And maybe the, where we want to begin is asking this question, what kind of writing experience do I want to create? So when we're writing and we imagine our reader coming to our text, we go, what, what's the experience of reading what I've just written? Um, and so clarity is really about storytelling. And I think most of us are probably pretty open to this idea of clarity as storytelling. And so the first thing that I want to start with when we think about clarity as storytelling is that we think of story, a story is made up of actors and actions, right? That's pretty obvious. Um, a sentence is the story of a complete idea. And a complete idea is a subject and a verb, right? We know who did, who did something and what did they do. So a sentence is actually a mini story and it's a mini story of a complete idea that as a reader, we can just, we get, we process and we understand. Um, a sentence is a story or a movie that the reader plays in her head. So imagine that when you write out, when you roll out a sentence and your reader is reading that, that 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 sentence is actually sort of like going into their brain and creating images inside of their brain. Um, and then the next one, number four, is a paragraph is the story of one big idea and um, made up of smaller stories of ideas in sentences. And I think uh, we often think about paragraphs as, you know, I'm trying to get across a few different ideas, but really a great paragraph is the story of one idea. Um, and lastly, clear sentences form clear paragraphs that become clear stories with clear actors and actions. So you want to imagine that the best sentence you can write becomes this very easy movie that the reader plays, plays in their head and they're just following. Okay. So let's get some examples of this. What do I mean? A sentence is a story with actors and actions. So when we read, we create a movie of mental images of those actors and actions. Um, what I'd like everyone to do is just read this story. If you could just read this story. I'll read it out loud too. A bike was ridden into a curb yesterday. The curb absor absorbed the force of my head. A helmet offered protection. Injury did not occur. So maybe after reading this, you're going, yeah, this is clunky. You're like, you had to reread or you've read it, but you still, you had to work a little bit. And it's because as you're reading it, you're trying to form mental images in your head, but the way this is written, the lack of clarity in it is getting in the way of your brain creating that movie. So let's, let's if this is a bad example of not being able to create that very clear movie in someone's head, let's take a look at a good example. So let's read this. I fell off my bike yesterday. My head smashed into the curb. I was wearing a helmet. I walked away unharmed. And hopefully you're all seeing that as you read these four sentences, you, 
you almost felt as if you were just listening, that you weren't actually reading, you weren't working. But the way that it was written, the clarity with, 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 with which it was written, just created this kind of story in your head. And maybe for some of you, um, when you read, my head smashed into the curb, you might, have, you might have winced a little bit, even though you're not seeing that, but in your brain, because it was written so clearly, you actually did create that image in your head. Um, and this is an example of the effect of good writing is that it just creates this ex reading experience where we just feel like we're kind of listening and watching a movie and we're not actually reading. Um, and so how is that created? Well, the subject and verb of a sentence are the engines of clarity. They are responsible for creating and carrying clarity in a sentence. And so if we look at, if we look at this simple sentence, I fell off my bike we could remove everything but the subject and the verb and there is still significant clarity. So if we have this sentence, I fell off my bike. And then if we just have, if we take off, off my bike and we have, I fell, there's still a little mini story in that subject and verb. However, if I remove the subject and the verb and all I have is off my bike, off my bike, there's no story. There's no clarity. There's, it's hard to create a mental story of that. So again, this is just kind of proof about how your subjects and verbs are the, the engines and the carriers of clarity. All right, so here are the five principles and I'm gonna read them and then we're gonna go into the specifics of them. So first is you wanna make your subjects and verbs the big actors and actions of your texts. The second is you wanna put your subject and verb at the beginning of the sentence. The third is you wanna keep your subject and verb close to each other. The fourth is the more subjects you have, the more work the reader will have to do. So fewer subjects equals reader centric writing. And lastly, create easily found logic links between each sentence. And we'll get into these specifics now. The other thing that I want to um, emphasize is that these are principles, which is different than rules. And so what do I mean by principles? It's this, if you follow these principles, you are more likely to create clarity. It is not, if you follow these principles, you will create clarity. And it, and it is not, if I don't follow these principles, I won't be clear. But these are the general uh, principles or guiding ideas about how to create clarity, that if you follow these, you are more likely to create clarity. The other thing to think about it, this is that if you understand these principles deeply, you can then use them more knowingly, create clarity more knowingly. And you will know when you're not necessarily following one of the principles, but you'll do so knowingly. Okay, so here's that, here's that paragraph again. And we're, we're going to break it down now, looking, uh, looking at this paragraph through the five uh, principles of clarity. So here we go. Make your subjects and verbs a big actors and actions of your text. So, the first sentence, I write in response to your letter of October 12th, 2016 to Dean Beckett concerning your client, Donald Trump, the Republican Party nominee for president of the United States. Um, in this legal letter, the big actor, if it's a movie, if we think about this legal letter as a movie, the big actor and act, or the big actors and actions are um, the New York Times, the legal counsel who represents the New York Times, um, the, the actions that are going on are writing and communicating. And um, so in this first sentence, this, is, this illustrates principle one, where the David McCraw, the, the author of the letter said, wrote, I write, which, and he's right away putting um, the New York Times and, and himself as the major actors of this movie. All right, so let's move on to uh, principle two. Put your subject and verb at the beginning of the sentence. And so this same sentence, I write in response to your letter of October 12th, 2016, so on and so forth. What does it mean to put your subject in the verb at the beginning? It means to front load clarity. It means that your reader comes to that sentence and immediately gets the big important pieces of clarity. Uh, a funny story I always tell about this that relates is that um, because I'm a parent at night, I have very little time. Right? And so if I watch a movie, I need to be very effective about the movie that I choose. And I need to make sure that that movie is interesting or that show is interesting. And so there's a great, cool, artsy movie called Roma. Maybe some of you have seen on Netflix. And for the first 10 minutes of Roma, nothing happens except it's this 
cool artsy shot of a, uh, of a, a, a broom pushing water into a drain. And it's, <laughs> the idea is that for 10 minutes as an exhausted parent, my wife and I are sitting there going, what is this about? And as parents, we don't have time for artsy 10 minute uh, intros like that. We want an actor in an action. We want something happening right away. We want uh, a bank robbery. We want, you know, we want something happening. And this is how it works in sentences that our readers do not like to have clarity delayed or deferred that generally we like all the clarity up front. We want to know what's going on. Okay, keep your subject and verb close to each other. And um, so this sentence, again, I write, the, ver the subject of I and write are right next to each other. So you might be going, well, what, what do you mean? What does it mean to keep them close to each other? What if I don't keep them close to each other? Well, I have a sentence here that breaks this, that doesn't follow this principle, and I'll read it out loud to you. Uh, the theories of American philosopher John Dewey, whose writing in the early 20th century had a significant effect on the discourse of K-12 education, in particular, the contro controversial debate over the aims of education, still shape how modern educators conceptualize learning. Now, what I want to talk about here is where is the subject in relation to the verb? And what, what's happening is the subject is the theories. And what I'm doing by separating by putting so much distance between the subject and the verb, is I'm essentially asking my reader to carry a heavy weight, a carry a heavy cognitive burden, which is this. I introduce the subject, and now the reader is going, all right, well, what about the theories? You've told me the subject. Now, what are the theories doing, or what, what's the verb for theories? And in between that, I introduce a relatively complex idea or set of ideas. So who's writing in the early 20th, early 20th century. And then I introduce this complex idea to my reader. And then I ask them by introducing the verb to go, I hope you remember the subject that I gave you at the beginning of this sentence. And in academic writing, we see this a lot more often. Um, and in some ways the academic writers, and I'm generalizing, academic writers and academic readers agree that this is okay. They, under, they both agree that we're, you're going to have to work a bit, right? But generally, what most of us, we don't want our readers to work. And so that's why we keep our subject and verb right, right next to each other. Okay, principle four is you wanna minimize the number of different subjects or actors you have, and the reader will find it to be a less effort, effortly, uh, effort required experience. Um, so in this paragraph, the legal letter for the New York Times, there's four sentences. And if it's a movie, there's only two characters. So there's only two actors in that movie. And most of us can handle a movie with only two actors. We're not confused. We can figure out what's going on. Um, so the subjects uh, of this legal letter are I, which is the, legal, the, the, the lawyer for the New York Times, you, the lawyer for, for Donald Trump, and then lastly, we, which is essentially the New York Times. So that's a, that's a more or less a synonym for the, for the first, uh, for I. And so there's four sentences, two different subjects. And what this means is the reader can follow more easily. Like when you're watching a movie and there's only a few characters, you never go, wait, who's this person, right? But if we take something like um, Game of Thrones, which maybe a few of you have seen, I'm you know, um, joking. I, this is a character map for Game of Thrones. There are 107 characters in eight seasons. And so I don't know um, how all of you experienced Game of Thrones season eight, if you did watch it, but, and if you didn't, you can relate to this experience if, when you're unsure of what's going on in a show or movie. Is I'm watching the show and a new character or a new character or an old character comes in. Immediately now I'm going, as a, as a viewer, I'm going, okay, who is this character? How do they relate to everything? And I'm, I'm watching, but I'm, I, so I'm split screen now in my brain. I'm watching the show, but I'm also trying to figure out how this character fits in, uh, if it's into everything. And then for me, a third screen comes up and I'm like, why am I struggling with this? Is, does, are other viewers not remembering? And then the fourth screen comes up for me, which is like, am I already experiencing cognitive decline? Am I not, you know, am I not as sharp as I used to be? And then at a certain point, 
I have to pause because I've missed just what's happened. And so um, in our writing, what we want to do is be really clear about who our subjects are and not overwhelm our, our reader with lots of different subjects because we're asking them to do more work. And, and the worst case scenario is at a certain point they stop reading because they go, I, I just can't follow. And this applies to business writing, this applies to creative writing, this applies to all kinds of writing, um, even, um, even presentations that you might give. All right, lastly, we want to create clear logic links between sentences so that the reader stays close to your logic, to, stays close to the line, that, the, the, the ideas that you're trying to create in, in your text. So imagine if I get this email from a bank. Hi, bank customer. The stock market is not going so well. How was your weekend? Communication is important to us. Thanks, your bank. As a reader, what I'm thinking is, whoa, this is, not how I, this is not what I normally read. I'm really figuring out these three sentences and how they all connect to each other. The stock market's not going so well. Okay, how was your weekend? Well, I don't see how those two sentences connect. There's nothing about my weekend and the stock report, or is this what they mean that, you know, I had a bad weekend because the stock market, you know, and then lastly, communication is important to us. How does that fit in? So what we want to do, this is an example of a not having logic links, which are, links between sentences that um, fuse and build meaning so that our reader just marches along with us in the text. Um, so here's the uh, legal letter um, from the New York Times. What we see is in each sentence, there's a link between the one before and the one after. So if in, in this first sentence, it's I write in response to your letter. And then in the next sentence, the author refers back to what he mentioned in the first one, which is you write. And then in the next sentence, he links back to that again. He creates the logic link by saying you, and, and that links back to you write in the, in the second sentence. And then in the last sentence, it's we decline to do so. And that we links back to the we of the, of, of the, of the previous sentence. And so this is how we keep our reader with us is that we build a sentence and we build a second sentence using some element of the previous sentence. I know some of you might be going, AJ, that's completely obvious. But as writers, what we often do when we're writing, we are moving between ideas in a way that makes sense to us. And we might go, oh, well, obviously this refers to this. But for our readers, especially when it's complex, you know, complex information or a complex topic, our readers aren't necessarily following in the same way that we are thinking they are following. And so um, whenever someone might say, well, your writing is kind of choppy, what they're saying is, I'm struggling to link meaning and understanding between your sentences. Okay, so how do I use the five principles? Um, it's difficult to go down to, to think about, oh, I'm gonna write a sentence and I'm just gonna use all five principles as I write this sentence. That's not the optimal way to think about the five principles. The best way to do it is to think about when you revise. So you've written something and you go back and I'm sure all of you have had this experience and you go, this sentence isn't working, what's going on? My advice to you is you diagnose that sentence using the five principles. And the first place you begin with that diagnosis is principle one, which is what is my subject and verb? Because my argument is that 90% of the time, a, a sentence isn't working because the subject and verb aren't working. So the idea would be, um, the first place to look is, if a sentence doesn't feel or sound right to you is go to the subject and the verb. Um, the next thing, way to use the five principles is that I'm sure all of you have felt this. I know, I think I, I know what I want to say, but I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to say it. Or I, I have all these ideas. I don't know how to put them down. One way, and this, this is often why we procrastinate. One way to, to begin to write, to begin to address this problem of, I have all these ideas. I don't know where to begin is grab one of those ideas, figure out what the big actor or the big concept is, and then put that as your subject and build from there. And then take that, maybe again, take that subject and make it the, the subject of your second sentence and build from there. So you can use the five principles in a way 
to address procrastination and also just to begin to make sense of something. And this is especially important when you're thinking about, um, when you're writing about something very complex is you have to tie down that complexity. And one way to do is, is take one of the big concepts or big actors of that com complex topic, isolate it and make that the subject of your sentence and start to build your ideas from there. Um, and that relates to the last one too, is when you don't know how to start a sentence, one way to do it is look at your previous sentence, grab an element from that previous sentence and then build the, the next sentence with that element. Um, okay, so I'm going to now have Haley help out with this idea of how can pro writing aid help with clarity? Yeah, awesome. So clarity is something that we think a lot about at pro writing aid um, because it's one of the most effective ways to communicate your ideas. And that goes for whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, everything that AJ was just kind of talking about. So I'm going to share my screen uh, briefly, and we're going to talk through some of the tools that we have in pro writing aid to help you with clarity. Um, and so when we think about clarity, it's not just one thing or another. There are many things that go into making a subject or excuse me, a sentence more clear. Um, one of the things are, are uh, or excuse me, a lot of the reports that we kind of have that deal with clarity are over here in our readability section. Uh, we also have some here in style as well. Um, so let's go ahead and look at style first. So again, when I'm thinking about clarity, some of the things that I think about personally are, um, again, like AJ was talking about, are my subject and verb close to each other? Um, is the meaning obscured or hidden? I also personally like to think about um, the language that I'm using and the, the specific word choice that I'm using to kind of round out my sentence. Um, so am I having adverbs? Um, am I using complicated or, uh, or difficult language to read? I think one of the things that we tend to do as writers, um, at least I know that I do, is uh, look for like fancy words or fancy phrases. It's kind of a leftover habit from when I was in high school trying to like pad out my essays in college and that type of thing. Um, but really when you're trying to write again, whether it's fiction or nonfiction for a purpose, you really want your work to be um, extremely clear and extremely readable. Um, so, okay. Within Pro Writing Aid, our writing style check has readability enhancements. So these enhancements are getting at clarity. So let's go ahead and look at the word very. There we go. Um, so very, for instance, is an adverb and the overuse of adverbs within your writing can, uh, can make your work harder to read. It can also just make it overly wordy. So some of the recommendations we'll make are to replace adverbs with stronger adjectives or stronger other words uh, that can get your point across more clearly and with fewer words. That helps to make, um, that helps to make your sentence uh, easier to read. Another uh, example are our passive voice checks. Um, so passive voice checks and passive voice is a great indication that that subject and verb might be hidden or might be written in a way that's harder for you to understand. Um, so uh, with, within the structure of passive voice, uh, your verb or the action and your subject are usually obscured. obscured. You're leading with the object. The subject is hidden at the end. Um, so our passive voice check within our style check um, can help you find those types of things. Now we also have our readability reports like I was mentioning before. Within the, these, we have both readability and sticky sentences. So our readability report analyzes the readability of your text. Now, readability is basically looking at kind of the grade level. Um, and this is one of the things that I was really surprised to learn when I started writing professionally and not just, again, as a student trying to meet my word count or my page count, um, was that we don't want our work to be overly difficult to read. Um, and typically experts actually recommend that we write at around a sixth or seventh grade level um, in order for it to be the most clear. So our readability checks here uh, highlight different parts within your text that are easy to read or that they're difficult to read so that you can find those texts, those pieces in the text and make changes to the language to make them more readable. Again, we're typically aiming for easy to read for that goal of clarity to make our point come across more easily as um, and to help us uh, just, again, get the message across without any confusion. Now, I will say that that goal can change depending on the audience that you're writing for. So when I'm writing for the Pro Writing Aid blog, I'm always aiming to be in that kind of sixth and seventh grade uh, 
level so that our writing is most accessible for the most people. If you're an academic writer or you're writing in an institution or you're writing a complex business report or you're writing a technical manual or something like that, um, you might want your readability to be higher because you'll have more complex words, more complex phrases, that type of thing. Um, so within Pro Writing Aid, you can make changes to your writing style so you can set academic or business, which changes the readability recommendations that you get um, so that you're able to, again, account for a setting in which those, um, those changes or those higher reading levels would be more possible. Um, now, another report that we have is our sticky sentences report. Um, this is actually one of my favorite reports because, again, it was something I had never really heard about before coming to Pro Writing Aid. Um, so sticky sentences are sentences with a lot of glue words. And glue words are basically words that kind of clog up your sentence without actually adding anything to it. Um, so these are the basically 200 or so most common words in the English language. Um, there are words like that or the or he or to or, you know, words that we tend to add in excess um, where we don't actually need them. Now, the sticky, when you have sticky sentences, which have those glue words in them, it doesn't mean that your English is wrong, right? And just kind of like we were talking about with AJ, your writing isn't incorrect. But what can uh, happen is that there are too many words, it becomes too difficult to read and to get to, again, the real meat or purpose of the sentence. So when we look at the sticky sentence report, we're able to identify sentences that have higher glue percentages um, and then see the specific glue words that are in there so that we can remake the sentences um, without those to, again, get them a little bit clearer, a little bit simpler and sharper and to the point. Um, now, we typically recommend that uh, our set your sentences have a glue target index of about 40%. So that means that about 40% of the words in your text are glue words. Anything above that will flag in our system as having too many glue words um, and that you should take a look at it. Uh, this kind of gets into, you know, what can you do to change this? Um, so one of the best things about Pro Writing Aid is that it gives you a lot of information about what's going on in your text, but doesn't make choices for you. So as a writer, we want you to be able to have the final say over what your text says, over the readability of your text, over the number of sticky sentences, or whether you use passive voice, all of that type of stuff. Um, and so our sticky sentences check again identifies where these sentences are. It tells you what the words are in there that are glue words so that you can try to remake the sentence if that makes sense for the context, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, so yeah, so we have a ton of different reports for, again, for getting at clarity. Um, I want to address kind of one of the questions here because we can talk about the repeats check in Pro Writing Aid, but I want to get your um, opinion first, AJ. So Jonathan asks, what about repetition? Is this a good or bad thing. Public speaking advice tells uh, includes tell the audience what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. And does this apply to writing? And if so, when? It's a great question. And um, I think uh, some version of this question has kind of been asked by a lot of people. And so here is my uh, two things. One is, first, it depends on the, the communicative situation that we're referring to. So like, if as, as you all know, if you've ever watched someone give a speech, you generally prefer repetition because you don't have the actual transcript of what's being said. Um, and so there's a famous speech by Steve Jobs and uh, a commencement speech at Stanford. And there's lots of repetition in that. And I think what, maybe you'll, maybe you'll agree with me on this. Um, as a writer, you see repetition more than your reader does because you're the one who's spending so much time with those words that you're repeating. The, the second point is that humans have horrible memories and we love to be reminded of things. One way to get around repetition is that you use synonyms. So rather than say, if a character's name is John, you would say he right? Um, that's one way to do it. Or there's other synonyms that you could probably come up with. Um, and so th that is a really good question. So one is, it really depends. I think a lot of presentations generally have not enough repetition, but in your writing, it really depends. Business writing often also is, the, the, the idea of business writing is land a few ideas powerfully. And a few ideas to me means you're likely going to repeat th those ideas at some point. So. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question and 
as AJ was saying, I think it's so dependent on the context that you're in. So AJ and I both have backgrounds in teaching AJ at the college level and university level. And then I taught in elementary school. And so when you teach in elementary school, you repeat everything 1000 times because you want the students to be able to have something sink in. And really when you look at like a daily lesson objective, it's very, very small. And again, it's like AJ was saying to get that repetition. So I think when you're delivering material orally, um, and trying to get uh, to trying to get a point across that has a learning objective, you want to kind of have those repeats and those echoes in there so that those main points are sinking in. Um, I do want to address repeats in fiction, though, um, and I think when we're thinking about repeats in fiction, we can think about it in a couple of different ways. Um, and so I have this background as a classroom teacher, but I also do a lot of fiction writing myself. Um, and so one of the things I actually struggle with is getting a word stuck in my head that um, I use over and over and over again. And it's one of those places where a synonym, like AJ was saying, could pop in and actually <laughs> add, add value to my text. Um, so for instance, I write a lot of fantasy and I got really stuck on using the word luminous for a while. So I was just mm-hmm. describing, describing absolutely everything as luminous. Um, so there are instances where uh, repeats, again, not necessarily repetition in terms of cadence or in terms of point, but repeats in terms of how you're using words or like specific words or phrases um, when, within fiction writing can be a little bit dangerous and be like the, the sign of an amateur writer. So the repeats check within Pro Writing Aid can help you find those repeat words or phrases. Now, I use this again when I'm writing my fiction to find where I say like luminous a thousand times and change it up to be at least some type of other <laughs> adjective to be interesting for my reader. But you could also apply it to an education setting or a speech setting to check for the opposite if you have enough repeats in there. So if you're writing for your speech and you want to make sure that you're honing home the um, the final, you know, the message and that type of thing, you could also use this to say like, hey, have I said this enough? Has my phrase come up enough um, to make sure that you're getting those points across? Um, okay, we have a number of other questions. Let's dive in. Um, okay, so Carla says, putting your subject and verb at the beginning of the sentence may become tiresome when you start every sentence with a pronoun. How do we work around that? Yeah, I actually, um, I'm going to share my screen and I want to show you an example um, of the principles kind of operating in both a functional, like a, they're creating clarity, but also in a creative way. Um, and so this is uh, from Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. And these, um, these four sentences, uh, I don't think anyone would find these uh, overtly technical or not creative. But when we, when we apply the five principles, what we see is that the main character, so this is a paragraph about a character named Pocola Breedlove. The main character is, is she. And in each of these sentences, um, she is the subject, right? So as a reader, you finish these four sentences understanding who the, like the main idea of this, and it's about this particular character. Um, someone said, what, I don't want to necessarily start all of my sentences with uh, you know, the subject, and that totally makes sense. And I think this is a great example. Of, let me, uh, I think this is a great example here where it says, um, elbows bent, hands on her shoulders and then we get the subject. So those um, six words before the subject do not throw off our clarity, right? And, and so this is, goes back to my idea of the, the principles, not as rules, but as guidelines and not as binary. Either you broke it or you didn't, but f- seeing it as on, a, a, on a spectrum. So six words before the subject is not a problem, especially these kind of cool, creative, descriptive words of the subject but 16 words could be kind of tough. Um, And then what I really love too, is this is such a great example, is this last sentence, beating the air, uh, a winged but grounded bird. That is the the she of the previous sentence, you know, and now she's using a different way to describe her main subject. Um, And so I think this is an example of someone 
following the principles, but not following them, but still creating clarity and creating a kind of poetic experience for the reader. Awesome. Um, okay, so we have a couple more questions about uh, maintaining clarity in academic writing, where you're doing, where your sentences might be more complicated, where, you know, you have deeper ideas, that type of thing. Oh, sorry. Can yeah. you re re repeat that? Yeah, it was just about uh, maintaining clarity. The question was just like, how do you maintain clarity in academic writing, where the ideas might be a little bit more complicated, the sentence yeah. structures might be harder, that type of thing. Yeah. So I um I my I wrote a my dissertation was on this question of knowledge transfer in writing. So how do you learn something about writing in one situation and then apply it to the next? And what I found was that it was my, my dissertation advisor kept going over and over, what do you mean? What do you mean? And ultimately in academic writing, I think what you want to identify is what are the five to six to seven to eight core concepts that you're talking about? And then build your writing around those concepts. Um, and in it, uh, academic writing is is a really generalized way of describing um, all the kinds of writing that goes on in K-12 or higher ed. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, we, I use this term too. What I was thinking is, um, you know, in, if you're a professor trying to publish writing, what one of the key things that we often say is you must define your key terms, right? You can't just use terms in a vague or imprecise way. Editors will point those out. And so thinking about what are my key terms, how am I going to define them, and how might I make those the subjects of my sentences? Not every sentence, right, but often. Awesome. Um, okay, we have another question that's a little bit more about um, writing, using pro writing aid and running all of the reports. Um, so Joanne says, I love this, but to actually run all these reports seems incredibly time consuming and possi possibly creativity stifling. No. Um, and so my suggestion for using pro writing aid with that would be to think about First of all, think about it within the context of your writing process. So I very rarely use pro writing aid when I'm writing or getting my kind of first draft done. I use it when I'm within the editing process itself. So I think of those as two distinct steps for myself. So I write, I get my first draft done, and then I move into editing. Um, and so then I do the editing work and it becomes part of my process there. Um, another suggestion would be to pick the reports that work the best for you and figure out the reports that get at your particular strengths and weaknesses. So again, I tend to repeat and echo and that type of thing. Um, so I use those a lot, but uh, I have, because I've been writing at a particular kind of grade level for audience consumption more, I don't use the readability check as much anymore. Um, same thing with like the sentence links and sentence structure. I don't use those as much anymore, but again, I am, always echoing and always repeating. So I go straight to those. I also have adverbs and I can sneak some passive voice in there as well. So I will look at those reports. So another suggestion would be if you're, as you're going, you can kind of br uh, bring in the reports that make the most sense for you and your writing. A good way to start is just with our real-time suggestions. Um, our real-time suggestions will hit those passive voice places. They'll hit misspellings. They'll hit um, basic punctuation errors and that type of thing so that you're able to kind of make uh, substantial edits to your text, but it's happening in real time and it's not kind of that time consuming report where you'll have to go in and edit your sticky sentences or something like that. That usually comes later down the line. Yeah, if I could just build on what Haley said and also, also what Teresa and Liz and Jeannie um, have said is I use the reports as a way of seeing my text in a different way. That is, whenever you're writing something, unfortunately, your perspective is your own narrow perspective. And it's so hard, if not impossible, to step outside of that perspective. And what the, the tool does is it helps you see, uh, see your text differently so that you can grow. That, that, I mean, isn't that what we're all trying to do? And I think that's the best part of it, is to see it from a different perspective. Yeah, and a lot of times we're so close to our text that we can't close, necessarily exactly. analyze it ourselves. I mean, 
I know sometimes for me, writing comes extremely easily, but sometimes it's laboring and it's a labor of both hatred and love. So having that second opinion from the tool helps me again, see those places where I was a little bit more weak in my language or where I could shore up what I'm writing to make sure it's ready for public consumption. Um, Awesome. All right. Just, it looks like we are almost done uh, with questions. So if anyone has any more, we are happy to chat about stuff. We have about 10 more minutes. Um, one thing that I also wanted to add to is that I found um, part of being a great writer is also being an, an editor for our friends and, and for other people. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that, and this is especially problematic as someone who teaches writing, is that many of us maybe have gotten feedback from a, a friend or a professor and they'll circle the sentence and say, question mark, right? And that is not really effective feedback, you know, that is, um, and so instead, what I often am now able to do is to say, um, so it's not just that like the, the principles can help you with your own writing, but they can help you diagnose in a more effective ways and give people help in more effective ways they're about their own writing and say, rather than say, oh, this sentence isn't working, you say, I think there's something up with the subject and verb or, you know, the sentence, you know, some, some aspect of it. So that, that's another way to think about the, the clarity principles. Yeah, and when it comes to the mechanics of a lot of the fixes, I think having something in an editing tool helps you to get first to see how often you're making a particular mistake. Um, so to kind of see, okay, I, I do this a lot. So this is something that I should address and be cognizant of as I'm moving forward and writing more. Um, and like AJ was saying, even if you're working with a human editor, um, whether that's a teacher or whether that's a person that you pay to edit, sometimes they'll just make the corrections for you. Sometimes they'll just put a question mark. Sometimes if you're working with an editor, again, on a fiction piece, they might be more concerned with the structure and flow and plot of your work than with the actual mechanics of the words that you're putting on the page too. That might come at the, the very end of the editing process, um, or it might come at the very beginning and then they get bogged down in that and don't focus on the structure and that type of thing. So the great thing about a tool is that it is, uh, it is, is there forever and it has it's there on your time so you can use it and you can kind of dive deeply into those learning points and see them as a way to continue to improve your writing uh, as you move forward um, okay a couple of questions came in um, uh, someone asked do you have further advice for effective editing of college term papers for example shorthands uh, I'm not familiar with shorthands. I, I, th this might be just my U U.S. Yeah, I'm not cent sure either. Cent centrism. Yeah. But um, I think that uh, I want, one advice for sure that I would give you is that for college term papers, for sure, is uh, what the pro writing can help with is just making that text look really polished. And this is sort of um, an inside view of, of uh, teachers and, you know, Haley, I'm sure you can speak to this too, a professor's life is that it, you might have in your, I think in your college, pa your term paper, you might have amazing ideas, but if you have a bunch of grammar errors or if you have um, just a lack of polish, it's, some professors will immediately just be turned off from it and they won't see your amazing ideas. Um, and so that's one, one suggestion I have for the, um, the college term papers uh, in terms of the, the tool. Awesome. Um, here's a great question. What ways can we, in what ways can we reinforce clarity specifically for a statement of purpose? I know I'm going to ask Van if you, uh, if I hope I said that correctly, if you could put in what, um, the statement of purpose, is that for? Uh, oh, he said for, for professional schools or jobs. Yeah, for, okay, great. Um, this is a, a classic question is often when we do a statement of purpose, like for, let's say a grad school or a cover letter, there's a natural impulse to just talk about ourselves. And what you want to do is make sure that you talk about yourself you talk about the organization you want to join, whether it's a company or a college, but more importantly, you talk about the relationship between you two. So one thing that I often do when a student hands me a cover letter or a statement of purpose is I actually just scan it for all the subjects. And if the student is, the, is always the subject of every sentence, I say, you know what, you're going to, you're going to need 
to, to talk about the organization more. I'm not seeing that organization. So in a sense, for the statement of purpose, what um, a college or organization is looking for is, does this person know me? Um, uh, you know, do, do they get me? And if you make them an actor in your sentences, they're more likely to think that, you're, that, the, that you understand them, that you're talking about them. So that's one way to think about it. Awesome. Um, okay, I think we are just about through. Um, someone asked about the different versions of pro writing aids. So there are a number of different uh, versions. The reports are the same across all. The just formatting that you receive them in is a little bit different. Um, so we have the editing tool, which is what I was just using, which is online um, that you can access. They also we also have the Microsoft Word add-in, which works straight in Word for PCs. We also have the desktop app, which works for PCs and Mac, and it's really great for use with Scrivener um, and a lot of other writing programs. If you're a screenwriter and use Final Draft, um, it can read tons of different files. Uh, then we also have the Google Chrome extension and Google Docs add-in. So the Chrome extension works basically everywhere um, and is really helpful for making sure your tweets don't have any mistakes, which is something that happens to me often. Um, okay, a couple quick questions. Any tips on balancing highly complicated scientific proposals with simplicity, yet making them highly readable or highly readable? Yes. So one idea, uh, uh, maybe Kumar or Santosh, is to do the following. First, uh, try to write your proposal to your, your aunt, who knows nothing about this. Just begin there. And even though you go, well, I'm not writing to my aunt, this is going towards, you know, start there. And what you'll find is that you're, you're going to force yourself to reduce the core big ideas um, in writing to someone who doesn't know anything about it. And then you can build up from there and add complexity to it. That's, that's one idea. Um, Awesome. We have another one about Claire. Oh, yeah. sorry. Were you going to? No, good. No, no. I, and then otherwise I just say share it, write it and share it with, with as many people as possible and, and ask them, what do you think the big idea of this is? Awesome. Doc has a question. How do you use clarity in dialogue, particularly when the characters are very different from the narrator? Mm, that's a really interesting question. Um, I almost want to throw this. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a neat. Uh, I don't know if that was an answer, but I want to throw this to Haley and then maybe I'll jump in. Yeah, so I think some things go a little bit out the window when we get to dialogue. Um, and that is because dialogue can be a reflection of your character. So your character could not be very clear themselves and that could be a plot point. What I would suggest is making sure that if your character speaks unclearly or um, you know has something, some kind of affectation for their speech, that that's an important kind of point for that character um, so that you're able to, again, get the, the message of what they're trying to say across um, within, within the writing itself. So again, it becomes a little bit difficult uh, or it becomes a little bit more nuanced with dialogue because people speak differently and you'll want to make sure that you're capturing those mannerisms. Um, but again, the same kind of sentence structure or the same kind of suggestions in terms of like word usage apply where um, if your cleric, you know, if your character is a professor, perhaps they're using a lot of different complicated phrases and or jargon if they're in business or something like that. Um, but if they're just a person, uh, you want the clarity to maybe come from how they speak or the, the structure of their sentences, but not necessarily by using a bunch of big words that wouldn't make sense for that person to use in everyday life. Um, okay, uh, I think we're just about out of time, everybody. So thank you so much for all of these um, amazing questions. Um, we are going to be doing a monthly session with AJ. So if you liked this session, we will be back on with him in a few short weeks. Um, so I'm going to drop into the chat one more time, the links to our events page, as well as our newsletter so that you can get that delivered to your inbox and stay up to date on everything we're talking about. Um, again, we have multiple events coming up next week. AJ will be doing another one in a few weeks. Um, and we had a couple people ask about 
family discounts. Um, so we can give you guys a 20% discount for attending this training. So if you want to use the code Zoom, Z-O-O-M 2020, uh, you can get 20% off ProWritingAid. So just go ahead and drop that into the uh, registration page and you'll get a 20% discount. And we'll send that out to you guys in your follow-up email as well. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump into thanks everyone for coming. And I think also as part of the kind of the community of Pro Writing Aid, I, I encourage you to um, shoot me an email with some of these, any, any follow-up questions. And clearly I enjoy talking about this. So um, yeah. <laughs> th thanks, thanks for participating. And, and uh, I'd, love to, uh, I'd love to hear from anybody. Yeah, we'll send out tomorrow uh, AJ's email so that you guys can reach him. And then you can always reach the Pro Writing Aid team on our Facebook, on Twitter, or at hello at prowritingaid.com. We are happy to answer any questions um, and just chat with you guys. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.